Um, g'day, g'day, and welcome to our third webinar uh, uh, series. Oh, sorry, third webinar of our series for 2021. This is a webinar series the Autism CRC is putting on for Autism Month of April. Um, my name is Andrew Whitehouse, and I'm super excited to be hosting you um, for today. We're holding six webinars um, throughout Autism Month to improve the understanding of autism, uh, as well as to share some of the Autism CRC's latest research and outcomes across the three programs of early childhood, the school years and adulthood. This webinar today has been uh, overwhelming in the interest in it. It's actually describing the landmark um, report um, uh, regarding interventions for kids, that's kids under 12, um, on the autism spectrum. The report summarises and synthesises the best available evidence for interventions um, for kids on the spectrum. So on Thursday, we're going to be talking um, about autism in the workplace, which will be a terrific one. Um, as well as Friday, we'll have a panel discussion featuring three autistic scholars, another great one. Um, it's not too late to register at all, so please do log on and, and register for those if, if they interest you at all. The webinar series has also features webinars on health, assessment and diagnosis, that was this morning and a terrific session, writing and transitions and community-led autism research priorities. If you missed any of these, don't worry, they're going to be on YouTube and um, they'll be popped up on YouTube in the next four weeks or so and you can access them also through our website. Um, before we get started today, I, I'd like to acknowledge um, that I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and that's in Perth, Western Australia, and um, I'm very, very um, uh, uh, happy and, and uh, excited as well as just to acknowledge uh, their continuing connection to land, waters, cultures, and I do pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the wisdom that they share with all of our work. For today's web, uh, webinar, I'd like to let you know that you can have the opportunity to submit uh, questions um, in the Zoom control panel. That's the, uh, the, the one with the two uh, speech bubble icons uh, down below. We've had to turn off the chat um, function today because we have um, well over a thousand people, um, in fact, 1800 people who registered for this, and it's just going to get a little too complicated to manage that all on the chat um, website or on the chat function. However, please do pop in your questions into the, that icon with the two um, speech bubbles, and we'll do all we can to get to as many questions that we can um, throughout the presentation. So, on to today's topic. So at the Autism CRC, one of the critical roles that we play is to provide evidence for best practice in the autism sector. This is why in mid-2020, uh, the National Disability Insurance Agency engaged us independently to uh, in, undertake an independent review of the best available evidence for non-pharmacological interventions. That's all interventions that don't involve pharmacological agents for kids on the autism spectrum. Today's webinar is all about that review and it's really exciting to, um, to, to see this take flight today. To take us through it, I'm joined by just two wonderful human beings um, and members of the Interventions Evidence Research Team and that's Associate Professor David Trembath as well as Dr Emma Goodall. So David's an Autism CRC project leader as well as an Associate Professor in Speech Pathology and Deputy Research Director at the Griffith University's Menzies Health Institute, um, as well as an adjunct um, senior research fellow at La Trobe's Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre. Alongside um, myself, David led the research team to summarise and synthesise the best available evidence for interventions for kids on the autism spectrum and produce the comprehensive report that they'll be talking about today. Dr Emma Goodall has a PhD in autism and inclusion um, from the University of Canterbury, Canterbury across the ditch, along with more than 20 years experience in education and research. Emma's also run her own consultancy, um, Healthy Possibilities, for more than 15 years. Through her consultancy, Emma works with kids and adults on the autism spectrum, along with their families and teachers to facilitate living well, uh, being happy and achieving their best. Just fabulous stuff. Emma is also a graduate of the governance program run by the Autism CRC Sylvia Roger Academy, which provides autistic adults skills and knowledge in board processes for not-for-profit government and corporate boards. Emma was a very valuable member of the Interventions Evidence Research Team, and I'm, I, I am personally thrilled that she could join us today. So without further delay, I'm going to shut up, and please just um, also, just one more reminder to chuck any questions you have in the Q&A panel, that's the one with the two speech bubbles, and um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So over to you guys. Thanks very much, Andrew, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for your interest in this presentation today and, and the work. Thank you very much, Emma, for co-presenting, and um, let's let's get straight into it. 
So I would too like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm meeting today. So those are the Kumbamari people, um, who are one of nine clans who speak the Yugambeh language in southeast Queensland, where I'm based now on the, on the Gold Coast. Interestingly, there are over 250 languages spoken by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and it's really important at all times that we acknowledge the diversity in, in the culture and the language of the traditional owners of this land. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This presentation is all about this report. And for information, please go to the CRC website. You'll find the report itself, as well as a range of resources. I'd like to also acknowledge the project team, including in particular, uh, four exceptional early career researchers who have supported this work. So those include Dr. Candice Farson, Dr. Hannah Waddington, Dr. Riley Sulik, and Dr. Kathy Bent, along with the STEAM team um, led by uh, Andrew Whitehouse as chair. We'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Cindy Stern, Michelle DeBoy, and Bonnie Dixon, um, who all provided consultancy to this work. Peter Dinantaris and uh, Lisa O'Brien and the teams of the NDIA, Andrew Davis, Kelly Jackson, Jason Kotzer at the Autism CRC. But in particular, the children and the families who are the original participants of the research included in this synthesis, some 40,000 children and their families. We'd also like to declare our interest as, as is good practice in any research endeavor. And we note that um, all members of the team receive support to complete this work and a full list of disclosures is available online. Both myself and Emma have disclosures in terms of our involvement in university programs, in um, research funding and support for the work that we do, and in activities related to clinical practice. Furthermore, we'd like to acknowledge the perspectives and preferences of different people we warmly acknowledge the diverse community perspectives and preferences in relation to how we understand autism, language and terminology, and also views around the relevance and the role of interventions, therapies, support, supports and services at individual, community and, and societal levels in the lives of individuals on the spectrum and their families. We seek to work in ways that unite us all in the commitment to upholding human rights, dignity, choice, and preferences of children and families who are the focus of this work. So in terms of the webinar today, what we're going to do is take you through four sections. I'm going to do the sort of dry out, what did we do as part of the process? And Emma's going to provide the what it means, the insights based on her professional and her personal expertise in this area. We're going to talk about um, the need to improve access to evidence-based interventions and supports, how to make sense of the different interventions options available, the, how to synthesize the evidence for these and to consider the next steps for practice and research. So let's start with the context. Why intervention? Well, it's a significant opportunity to support early development, to minimize disability and maximize each child's strengths and opportunities. And when we talk about minimize, dis minimizing disability, we're talking about creating options and choice. We're talking about the individual, but the society also in which they're living, growing and learning and participating. And there are numerous interventions available, which actually in many cases constitute a maze. And these interventions vary in terms of who they're designed for, what their goals are, how they're proposed to work, how they're used in practice and, and also the evidence underpinning their use. The challenge is the complexity makes it extremely difficult to understand what actually are the different interventions approaches for children on the autism spectrum and their families, and then to make informed choices about the most appropriate intervention for an individual child and family. And as I'm sure you know, you'd all agree, both of these are imperative to ethical clinical practice. Now there have been some very important pieces of work in this space over the years. There have been three key reports that have been supported by government departments to, to try to shed light on and understand the interventions available and the evidence for these. And these reports, combined with a range of other sources of information, have provided insights into what are the core principles that should underpin clinical practice. And these things include holistic assessment, 
to look at comprehensively at a person's strengths and challenges, their preferences in order to develop meaningful goals and adopt useful approaches. They have to be individually and family centered. Approaches have to take a lifespan perspective. When we're talking about children, we're talking about children who will become adults and the relevance of supports across their, their, lives, their, their lifetime and the way that the child and the family will grow and change over that period of time as well, including in their preferences and priorities. And interventions have to be evidence-based. As Andrew said recently, just a couple of days ago, we have to hold interventions in the autism space to the same standards we would expect in other areas of health um, uh, practice and provision. But there have been some limitations at these previous reviews. They were not designed, they're not intended to be as systematic as possible in the scientific sense. And a lot has changed in terms of understanding intervention options and also the evidence for different approaches. So we were tasked, the CRC was tasked by the NDIA to address two aims in this report to provide an overview of interventions that have been developed for children on the autism spectrum and their families and the training pathways in Australia for clinical practitioners who provide the interventions. We we're also tasked with reviewing the scientific evidence for the therapeutic and other effects of interventions for children on the spectrum to take a hard-nosed objective look at the research evidence. The report includes an introduction, a narrative review, an umbrella review, and extensive appendices in order to make every step of the process that we went through as transparent as possible. And yes, it's long, but it's for that reason. We really wanted to take everybody with us in our process and the basis on which the findings were delivered. So who's the report for? For individuals on the spectrum, their families, clinicians, policymakers, researchers, and the broader community. We have a large community of people who have a vested interest and a deep and passionate interest in providing the best possible opportunities for children on the autism spectrum and their families. And this piece of work is meant to support all of those different groups. But it's important to understand the scope of our work. Within an evidence-based approach to practice, there are three key ingredients the best available research evidence, evidence from clinical practice, including clinical wisdom, and most importantly, the preferences and priorities of fully informed uh, individuals, consumers, clients, and those around them. This report addresses the first issue. It's about the research evidence. In order to look at the whole of evidence-based practice, we must have these other two elements. Since publishing the, the report, and now in recent days with the NDI's consultation process around early intervention pathways, there's been a lot of questions about where our report, where the CRC report fits in. Again, it's about the research evidence. From there, community consultation is needed in order to come up with policy and practice guidelines that support the best practice in everyday um, community situations and settings. So if I can now please hand over to Emma to offer some reflections on this first element of the report. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Amy. Um, so it's really important that we realise in Australia, children are being diagnosed autistic a lot younger than they used to be many years ago, um, often long before starting school. And autistic children and young people are representing the largest disability group in the NDIS, but also in many education systems once they do start school. So the context is there's a great need out there to know what's effective for these children and young people. But when we're thinking about early intervention, that's really using the medical model. So in the medical model of autism, the impairments a person experiences need to be fixed or remediated. And in the social model, the challenges and supports experiences, support needs experienced by autistics are thought to be due to things like societal barriers, like living in a society that was created by and for non-autistics. And in this model, supports and strategies aim to remove these barriers. Now, no matter which way um, you want to think about intervention, the intervention should provide the opportunities to learn and practice new skills in a safe and nurturing context. 
so when families, um, individual autistics, even clinicians are thinking about this, how do they know which interventions to choose? How can they tell if the research and the intervention was carried out by the creator, the person delivering, selling the service, or if it was independently or rigorously assessed? So the context for this report was taking on board all those questions as well. And it was really important to look at a range of evidence and see if there was confirmation of effectiveness or lack of. And this review um, was focused on this part of the context, not lived experience of the interventions or strategies. So as David talked about, this is one third of that three part thing that makes up evidence best practice. So this report aimed to ascertain what the literature said was effective, who for, um, what for and over what time. Um, however, the literature turned out not to cover all of those aspects really well, and it certainly really didn't cover how individual autistics receiving those interventions felt about them or the usefulness of them. And it's just how it is. So we're going to um, look in more detail now at the narrative review. So David's going to take you through the narrative review, and this aimed to make logical and coherent categories out of all the myriad interventions out there that were detailed in the research that we were going to review for this report. Thanks, Emma. So yes, moving to the narrative review, making sense of the range of interventions. We were tasked with answering the following three questions. First of all, what's an appropriate method for categorizing the broad range of interventions available? What are the theoretical premises underpinning the different approaches and the principles guiding the practical application? And by theoretical premises, we mean the reasons why it's believed to work. And third, what are the clinical competencies that are typically required in the Australian context to deliver the interventions described in this report? In terms of terminology, there is no universal agreement around how to describe interventions. So to reconcile the various options available, we talked about an intervention technique as a discrete clinical strategy targeting the acquisition of a discrete skill. We talked about a practice as being a combination of techniques evaluated and implemented together to target the acquisition of one or more skills. And a category is one or more practices that share similar theoretical underpinnings. An illustration of this is provided in the report. For the report, we focused on practices and categories um, rather than the individual techniques. Often a clinician will combine individual techniques in a, what's described as a technical eclectic approach but that was beyond the scope of this report. So focusing on practices and categories. The issue is there are numerous interventions and as I said, no, uni no universal approach. There is also a great deal of overlap when it comes to categorizing the interventions available. So not only do we see inconsistency in terms of the technology, also in terms of the way that interventions are described with a lot of overlap. And this has created a maze, we mentioned earlier, um, for parents, practitioners, researchers, policy makers, and it ultimately impacts on children and their families. We adopted an approach to categorising interventions that was first proposed by Sandbank and colleagues in 2020. And this describes interventions or categorises them into nine different categories. I won't read through each of these individually, but we've presented this to illustrate these. And again, we provide detailed information in the report. But we are looking at behavioural developmental, naturalistic developmental behavioural, sensory technology, animal assisted cognitive behaviour therapy, teach and other approaches. In the report, we describe the theoretical premise, the clinical application, and where available, we present the principles underpinning the clinical use. In terms of clinical competencies, we'd suggest that it's not always intuitive how clinicians get trained to deliver interventions, and particularly for people who are coming to this space, um, including parents of children who are recently described as being on the autism spectrum. This can create a lot of confusion in the community, and we believe that making it clearer is an ethical imperative. Taking the information currently available, including a review of the practice documents from each of the professional associations in Australia, and focusing on allied health professionals in the report as per the scope, 
we identified three primary pathways to deliver interventions and to become skilled to deliver these. At the heart of this, the top of that figure you can see on the right hand side there, is around the professional qualification, which then leads to a registration, the safeguards, if you like, the checks and balances to ensure um, professional practice is appropriate. And then within that, we have the first pathway where we have a set of interventions that can only be provided by, by professionals with discipline specific competencies. And we've listed some of those there. Pathway two is where we, an intervention can be used within a professional scope of practice. It may also include interventions for, that are relevant to children with a range of other neurodevelopmental conditions. So these could include, for example, naturalist teaching strategies, incidental teaching and, and modelling. The third pathway relates to, they can be used if within the scope of practice, but also following additional training. And the examples we've provided there are approaches where the people who developed those programs actually provide the training for people to then use them. And they're responsible for evaluating the use of those approaches. So I'll pass to Emma to, to reflect on this first second element of the report. Thanks, David. I think this was a really interesting part of the report for me personally and, and professionally, because um, when you're thinking about a particular intervention and whether it's a family or a clinician deciding what intervention to use, there are so many different interventions. And as a parent, you might think, OK, I'd really like to build some social skills for my young person. OK, I'm going to have a look at all the things that are out there. And you might get 10 or 100 options that are advertised to develop social skills. And how do you know what they actually do? What is social skills? What does that mean they're going to develop that? Um, are they the same program, completely different? Were they designed through research? Is there an evidence base on their effectiveness? Or did someone just sit down in the living room and think this is a good plan? So this um, research was really aiming to get down to the bottom of all that and try and categorize things that made sense because it is really hard when different names are used for exactly the same intervention and yet the same name is used for completely different interventions. So it is a really, really complex situation. And then there was the fact that not all interventions were covered. I know that I had some feedback from other um, autistics after the report came out saying, why wasn't this covered? Why wasn't this covered? And the reason was, is that there actually wasn't much research on those areas. So there isn't the same amount of research on all interventions. And the reason is kind of twofold. Firstly, researchers need funding and time to do research. They work in universities, other organisations or independently where they've got a range of projects and research that they're working on at any one time that fit in with the whole overview of things. But also the other side of it is some interventions are much harder than others to research because the outcomes are not so easily defined. So if we think about assistance animals, for example, that's really hard to research because they might be doing a whole range of different things in that category of assistance. Whereas other interventions are much easier to research, for example, where outcomes are more obvious, such as increased use of speech or increased ability to communicate using a particular communication tool. And then finally, the delivery styles and types, and these are often thought by parents to be really um, crucial, for example, that one to one um, support strategies are always better than group support. And there was actually surprisingly research in this area. And as an autistic, I personally feel that the most important aspect of delivery style and type is that the individual attending the therapy or support feels valued and accepted and is comfortable to be there with whoever's delivering the intervention. It doesn't matter how much evidence there is behind an intervention, if the autistic isn't comfortable being there, they're not going to be taking on board the, the strategies and supports being offered. So I don't know how you research that either, but that's for me one of the, the key aspects of this. Thanks, David. Thanks, Emma. Well, let's move then to the, the evidence. So the umbrella review. How do we make sense of the evidence that is currently available? Let's think about the context. So there is this rapidly growing body of research studies. It's by no means comprehensive. And as Emma says, there are areas that have been quite 
seriously neglected in this way in terms of a focus of research, and we'll talk more about that. But we have a set of rapidly growing body of research, a set of individual studies. Imagine these five studies on the screen actually go up to thousands and thousands. And, in, okay, and increasingly, we have systematic reviews of individual studies, which attempt to combine the findings of these and synthesize those to make sense of those um, different individual studies. But the systematic reviews differ in terms of their focus, the questions they ask, their quality in terms of how rigorous their processes are, and the methods used in terms of combining and synthesizing data from across studies. Also, sometimes they overlap in terms of the studies that they include. So how do we make sense of all of these different findings? An umbrella review synthesizes evidence from a range of systematic reviews. It provides a method for combining and synthesizing findings. Importantly, it doesn't average the findings or find the middle ground. It provides a way of combining and synthesizing so that all evidence can be considered. Umbrella reviews are particularly suited to providing summary outcomes in a broad field of inquiry, so a higher level understanding of the outcomes, and also linking summary outcomes to policy. It can, if you like, be a, a single source of truth when it comes to understanding evidence at a particular point in time, always keeping in mind the scope of the review, the questions asked, and so on. So these were the questions we were tasked to answer. What interventions, non-pharmacological, have been examined in systematic reviews? What effects do they have on child outcomes, on family wellbeing? And what are the optimal delivery characteristics of these interventions with a focus on the amount of intervention, the setting, the format in terms of one-to-one -one or a group, the agent, the person delivering it, and the mode, whether in person, or via telepractice, et cetera. And the fifth question there, what child characteristics may influence intervention effects with a focus on child age, core autism characteristics, cognition, and communication skills? The process we went through, across the top of the screen, you saw, you can see the steps. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see some uh, information, a summary of steps we took to ensure the rigor and transparency of this process. So we determined the parameters of the literature search and at the same time, we've pre-registered our process, our protocol on Prospero and the Open Science Framework. We conducted the search and did the, and developed this search in collaboration with um, Cindy Stern at the Joanna Briggs Institute and Griffith University Librarians to ensure we were going to the right sources of information, a broad range of sources of information. We identified the relevant studies and all of our search records were independently screened and selected by two reviewers. We extracted the data, and for this, we independently checked the reliability for 20% of the um, extraction, and we completed consensus coding on the remaining 80% of all the data. And when it came to collating and summarizing and synthesizing the findings, we ensured that every piece of data presented in the report was checked by at least two members of the research team, and in most cases, many more. To be included in this umbrella review, the systematic review, remember this is not the individual studies, but um, systematic reviews of those studies. Um, so there had to be a systematic review with or without further statistical analysis. Include children on the autism spectrum aged zero to 12, be a non-pharmacological intervention focusing on the development of, um, on the acquisition or development of educational skills. Include at least one RCT, quasi RCT or controlled clinical trial. This refers to a randomized controlled trial, which is the best level of evidence when it comes to looking at, at the effects of an intervention in a population of people. Report summarized quantitative data on the impact of interventions for child and family outcomes of interest, and those were set by the NDIA, and be in a peer reviewed journal or as a publicly available scientific report with a full text copy available in the English language. So we started with over 9,000 records. After taking out duplicates, we were around 3,000. We completed a full text review for 478 systematic reviews, leading to the inclusion of 58 systematic reviews in the umbrella review.
The figure on the right there describes the process and the reasons why um, uh, records were or articles were excluded. In terms of the findings, what non-pharmacological interventions have been examined? So we identified 58 systematic reviews drawing on data from 1,787 articles. And these systematic reviews covered 111 intervention practices across the nine categories of interest. In terms of the second and third question, what effects do these have on child outcomes? And what effects do they have on parent and caregiver outcomes? In the report, you'll find a comprehensive table. It's, it's table six. Rather than go into, I will provide a brief summary of the findings in a moment, but I just want to orient you to the information that's available when you go into the report. Within the table, across the uh, top, are the outcomes of interest relating to core autism characteristics, related skills and development, education participation, and also family wellbeing. Down the side, we have the categories, the intervention categories, the nine categories. For each category, we then start with systematic reviews that looked at an assortment of practices in that category, followed by the findings for systematic reviews that looked at specific intervention practices. We include the number of systematic reviews and then the effects, positive, inconsistent or null. We also provide a summary of the quality of the systematic review, the process that they went through to come up with their findings prior to us synthesizing them. In brief, we found evidence indicating positive therapeutic effects for behavioral interventions, developmental interventions, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, technology-based technology interventions and CBT. Uh, cognitive behaviour therapy on a range of child and family outcomes. Found positive effects for sensory-based interventions for certain practices only, and they were limited to select child and family outcomes. We found evidence for a mix of inconsistent and null intervention effects on child and family outcomes for teach and animal-assisted interventions. The fourth question is to look at op potentially optimal delivery characteristics of these interventions, with a focus on the amount, or otherwise known as dosage, setting, format, agent, and mode. We found minimal data were available to answer these questions, and where the data were available, the effects were inconsistent or null, including for the amount, total hours, duration, and intensity of intervention. In relation to research question five about potential child characteristics may influence intervention effects. Again, minimal data were available from the systematic reviews and where the data were available, effects were inconsistent or null. Emma. Thanks, David. One of the interesting things is that when David and I started at the beginning, he went through our conflicts of interest. And as he said, it's on public record, everybody in the team's conflicts of interest. When you're doing a review of the literature at any level, one of the things you look for is, is there a conflict of interest? Who did the study? How is it funded? Why did they do it? So if I own, I don't know, a jam shop and I do research on my jam, I'm obviously going to say my jam's fabulous because otherwise no one will buy my jam. So it's really important that, that that's taken into account and that kind of links in with that quality of evidence. So when we're talking about a quality um, of evidence in terms of the literature, one of the things we're talking about is reproducibility. If someone does the same study, are they going to get similar outcomes or not? And that's one of the reasons our report is so long because everything we did is written into the report so that if somebody else chooses to go down the same process, hopefully they'll come up with the same um, results as we did. One of the things that wasn't in the quality of evidence as David talked about was that there wasn't a disclosure of unintended side effects very often. And by that, um, I mean, if somebody does uh, go to an intervention that has great evidence, what else happens? apart from the effective outcome that you're hoping for? Are there things that we would rather didn't happen? David talked about um, randomised controlled trials, RCTs, and how these are the gold standard of research across the population. And this is something that's very interesting because 
research of that type is mainly quantitative that's about numbers and this is this is what happens for this many numbers and as we all know autistics are very very different to each other um, so it's really hard because many of the people who spoke to me said well you know why isn't there more qualitative evidence in it and the reason was that this was an umbrella review that looks at um, those synthesis of other research reviews so that we're reporting on what other people have reported on and there isn't a lot of qualitative data in that doesn't mean that it's not valuable it just means it's not done in a population level and it really is difficult to generalize evidence for an intervention across the diversity of the spectrum and david pointed out that we did look to see was there evidence within the literature about what works for who does age impact does intellectual um, disability impact etc the communication skills impact and there wasn't any evidence it was inconsistent or there was null so we are different what works for one may not work for another if you have twins even so and you may both go to the same um, therapy and it may work for one and not the other so even taking all this you still have to go with my child as an individual and we need to be thinking about what works for them and for us as a family because it's no point in doing stuff that's not going to work for you as a family or your child thanks david thank you emma so the implications and the next steps so what could we answer in a nutshell? Well, we're able to provide some evidence for what interventions have a positive effect and for which on which outcomes. We could not answer, as Emma put it perfectly, what is likely to have a positive effect on which outcomes for which individual children. Few studies reported the effect of interventions on the children's education, their participation, and their quality of life. And caregiver outcomes were also rarely um, featured in this in the systematic reviews, including family well-being. There's also been a lack of attention in the systematic reviews to the potential for adverse effects, something that we need to see consistent and clear reporting of moving forward for research in the field. So the findings in terms of the clinical implications. There's no single, the findings reaffirm that there is no single best intervention for all children on the autism spectrum, and no intervention has been demonstrated to effectively target all of the child and family outcomes we're examining in this review, including optimised education, community participation, and quality of life. The interventions may vary considerably in terms of the total number of child and family outcomes that they address, from one to multiple, and there's a concerning lack of reporting of adverse effects in the literature to date, including null or negative findings. We can learn a lot from these findings, just as we, we, we learn from the positive effects. And they also help to keep people safe and when it comes to intervention delivery. So what are the next steps? We return to this figure, evidence-based practice. Again, the report helps to address this first element of research evidence. We require the clinical perspectives and the personal perspectives in order to lead to meaningful policy and practice. This type of approach was taken with the National Guideline for the Assessment and Diagnosis of Autism in Australia. And we would we recommend in the report that the same approach be taken when it comes to um, clinical service provision. The development of a living clinical guideline that can evolve as thinking and the evidence and the understanding uh, evolves. Emma. Thanks, David. I think one of the implications that's really um, kind of important to note is that there are interventions out there at the moment currently being offered that are not evidence based or useful. And that came out in if you look at the tables very clearly. And these are a barrier to improved life outcomes for autistics. It's a waste of time and money for the family and the child and everybody else. And some of them may even be harming the child. I accept that those reports and tables may be hard for many people to understand. Um, I really love reports and tables, but I was going through them to explain them the other day to some people. And it's possible that one of the next steps is that we need a very easy to read guide for families and professionals. 
Um, just having those symbols and those letters is too much for some people to take on board at the same time, particularly for families having a look at what we should do. And we need to do further research on the lived experiences of unintended consequences or adverse effects, as David described them, um, particularly whether it's an effective or an ineffective intervention. These need researching so that we can put those in um, to further study so that when families can say, oh, my child has these kinds of characteristics, when I look at this lived experience report, it's clear that person was completely different to my child. So that might not apply, or they're very similar, so that might apply. Thanks, David. Thanks, Emma. So what we've done here is a brief overview of the report and orientation to it, if you like. The work, we believe, does present a unique opportunity. We have at this point in time a synthesis of the best available research evidence, the next steps require diverse and informed thought, leading to practical and collective action. And at all times, in the interests of, of children, their families, that this report and this work is, is all about. So I'd like to just, uh, again, thank you for your interest in the presentation. And with, um, Emma and I would be delighted to, to take some questions. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, um, Emma and David, and thank you um, to everyone who's been asking questions. I have arthritis um, um, <laughs> now, um, after typing all those answers, we really do appreciate um, all of those questions. I've seen them all, I've been trying to group them into um, uh, uh, various themes so we can answer them. So we have 18 minutes now, and we're gonna rush as quickly as we can. Just to hit a few things on the head first up, yes, this will be available, this recording will be available, um, on the CRC website, I'll tell you at the end, as well as on the YouTube channel within um, a, a certain period after um, this webinar. Um, the slides will also be available for you to download on the CRC website. And um, one thing I wanted to address up front, we've had a couple of questions about this, but um, given the, um, you know, the, the current changes that the sector is going under, it, it would be really important to talk about how this uh, report um, uh, uh, feeds into the, uh, the NDIA's consultation report. David and Emma mentioned this um, within, their, uh, within their presentation, but I also just wanted to touch on it as well. Um, the, the important thing is that this was commissioned by the National Disability Insurance Agency, but the research team had complete independence as to how um, uh, the review was conducted, as well as on the findings. Once the report was delivered to the NDIA, um, the Autism CRC has a very strong view that this is one of three components that can feed into an autism um, early intervention guideline. The other components, as David says, is consultation with the clinical community, so clinical experience, and of course, um, the experience of, of the lived voice and family members as well. And that's the CRC's very strong view. The CRC had no input into the NDIA consultation paper that is currently out now, um, that we were independent in developing that report, and that was the extent um, of our um, uh, uh, involvement um, in, in this ad research. We led the report independently and submitted that to the um, uh, NDIA. David, did you want to add to that, David or Emma? No, I think that's really well said, Emma. Yep, no, perfectly well said. And fantastic, thank you. And and the other thing is that you can read the report and you can certainly download that. That's all for free. No funding recommend, recommendations was in the scope of the project or were put forward as well um, as part of this report. Now, let's get to a few questions. Um, David, um, I might throw this one to you. Um, uh, and and um, this one's actually on the quality um, of, of the research within there. Um, I, a few people noted that there were a lot of L's, so a lot of low quality research, even despite the minimum requirement for randomised control trials. Um, uh, I guess just a broad comment on the quality of research that was included within the report. And, and is that a call to arms for um, raising the, um, the, the level of quality within the research um, uh, in autism? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And thanks for the questions that have come in, obviously. Um, absolutely, we need to do better in terms of the way research is conducted. And so that means the way it's planned, it's conducted, and it's reported. 
So when you look at the report, you'll see the process that we use to evaluate the quality of each of those systematic reviews. And we looked at the key elements that gives us confidence that the findings that they report are, um, are accurate and reliable and those sorts of things. It's not surprising, to be frank, that the quality is generally low and at best moderate in most cases, um, because that reflects research more broadly in the field. The bar is getting higher and the, the standards, the expectations are higher and we need to rise to meet those. So yes, when we look at the evidence, absolutely. Look at those quality ratings. We wanted them right there in the table to contextualize the findings. Um, know that it's not just about this area of practice or research, but it is a, unfortunately a reflection more broadly. And yes, we have to improve um, from a research perspective. And as a community, we have to really um, drive the expectations around this that we want to be basing decisions on high quality evidence. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, David. And please do keep um, those questions coming in. Um, there was a question that I thought was a really interesting question and I'd really like to highlight it. It was around the quality of the clinician-child relationship and the things that you can't quantify in, in research. And this is something that we've grappled with all throughout that, that project. Um, Emma and David, did you want to um, mention what we can and can't quantify in research and how that feeds into the limitations? Um, I'll start and David. Go for it, Emma, please. I miss. Um, you can't quantify a lot of things is the honest answer. You can't quantify the quality of a relationship because to quantify things, you need to be able to define it. And you can't define the quality of a therapeutic relationship between an individual and a practitioner because all practitioners are different, all individuals are different, and we want different things. So what I want from a therapeutic relationship may be very different to what another autistic wants. So what might be quality for me might not be quality for someone else. So it's really hard to, to define things like that. And that's where you need to be thinking about the quality of that research. And I'm pleased that they've had L's in lots of places because it means that the research community is accepting the need to be better and it's being honest and open. And we need to have much more involvement from the lived experience so that we get a whole heap of lived experience you know, that says, this is what works for me, this is good for me, this is not good for me. And it'll be different for everybody. And that will confuse people even more. But what it will help do is say that we can't just say one thing is good for everybody. It really is yeah. a diversity. Yeah. yeah. If I can offer just a, I agree completely. You know the magic that you see between a parent, a caregiver and a, and a child when thing, they're just in sort of synchrony, they understand each other, there's magic happening in the way that they're doing things. You couldn't find a scale that could capture the quality of that interaction, right? We've all seen it and we know how powerful it is in children's lives, irrespective of whether we're talking about people described as being on the autism spectrum or not. The same is true to an extent for clinicians, educators, other professionals who work with children, sometimes they just have something that is just magic in terms of that relationship. And we should always be seeking it. We should always be um, placing children and, and professionals together who have that type of magic. But I would say it should always, from a professional perspective, be in the context of the magic is not enough. There has to be a clinical decision-making process that's evidence-based, underpinning that interaction so that while those two people are together in my view the magic is happening but it's happening in a direction that everybody understands that everybody can be on board with that people looking from outside would say that's a sensible that's a safe that's a positive way to help this child to, you know gain more choices in life greater independence and greater participation fabulous thank you to you both for such a thorough answer i really appreciate that um, we, we have had a couple of questions and uh, about intervention intensity. Um, so for those who don't know um, about what that term refers to, that's referring to how often um, clinical contact, so contact with the therapist might occur. And, and you know, is there an optimal amount? Is more better? Um, and I am denied about talking about this one, but I think it's really important that we do talk about uncomfortable um, things. And um, uh, there is often a... Uh, a, uh, a sort of a, a saying within um, the autism community that, you know, often more intervention is better. And um, we were really keen to look into this as hard as possible because um, 
our job was to get to the bottom of the evidence and to find what is the best evidence so we can help provide that evidence to support families um, during this particular time of their lives. Um, what, the, what the report found is that there isn't a great deal of evidence that intervention intensity, that means the number of hours spent um, uh, with a therapist in terms of um, improving um, the level uh, of improvement um, across. So there's not a great deal of association between intervention in intensity and improvement um, uh, across uh, uh, the therapy period. Now, the important things to say is that there is absolutely going to be a minimum amount of therapy that is important um, um, that a family receives. Um, um, however, it's really also important that we do examine that where there, where there is evidence, where there isn't at the moment, um, what the report found is that there isn't a huge amount of evidence for the previous assumption of um, uh, you know, dozens of hours of therapy per week um, in relation to improving outcome, is the best outcome for improving um, kids' uh, uh, development. David and Emma, did you wanna uh, elaborate on that? I think just from a, a practical perspective as an educator for many years and as an autistic person myself, um, I can't imagine anything worse than spending my entire time as a child in therapy nonstop. Um, we have to be realistic about the energy levels and interest levels of the individuals having those therapies and supports and interventions. Each of us is different and some kids will benefit from more than others and some won't be able to do much. It will suck their energy and, and they'll need time to recover and others will be energized by learning those new skills in those situations. So everybody's different again. Yeah. If I can split myself into three, from a research point of view, we looked at the evidence. And so we have a clear picture from that. We asked an important question and we found an important gap. So we have to look to those other areas of evidence-based practice. As a clinician, I know my colleagues and across disciplines have incredible insight into what it really means when we're talking about the amount of intervention and intensity and some very complex interactions between the level of skills and needs a child has and the amount of hours that might be provided. There's not an easy answer there. From a personal perspective as a human, yes, children need a rich, full week with lots of different experiences that they like and enjoy um, and opportunities to learn. So we need to somehow bring all of those three things together. That's what consultation is for. That's what um, is the next step beyond the report. Yeah. Agree. Um, I have an interesting question here about um, longitudinal outcomes and, and the importance, um, and I guess this goes to the quality of research, and that in when we look at research, we often see research done in research settings rather than community settings, and often they're not looking at longer term outcomes across later childhood. And I wonder if uh, David or Emma, I might throw to David first, you, you might want to comment on, on that as a research gap. Yeah, look, you've, you've said it really well. There is sort of a, at times the blinkers are on. It's a, we're looking at children and their development in a very finite period of time. Quite often in the research in a context that is not their everyday life or their everyday place and space and the people they're regularly interacting with. So that's the first challenge. And then to do that over time and say, okay, well, what happened back in 2020? What did it actually mean for this child as they went into school and, and then into adolescence and into adult life. And what part of what part in their life did that intervention play? Hopefully positive, but also, you know, really understanding all of the impacts of that um, work at that time. We do need to look at the longitudinal aspects. We need to, you know, families and children invite us into their lives as researchers at a particular point in time. And while that invitation remains open, we should hold up our end of the bargain of understanding what happens over that person's lifetime as well. Yeah, terrific. Emma, did you want to come in on that? I think it's harder than just that, though. As, as a parent of a child who's been in a long-term research project, every now and then, you know, over the 25 years, we miss out one because, you know, we were busy or not there or didn't get the letter or whatever. Um, people move house funding changes, et cetera, et cetera. So, and as a researcher who's tried to do long-term research, you know, we're talking two years is long-term in research because it's again, the funding and everything else. So yes, I love David's idea and I think it's the ideal and it is the ideal, but that's the reason why there isn't a lot of longitudinal research because there isn't in many fields. Yeah. 
And we could like. just add, add to that as well in that, you know, we looked at a particular point in time, but already things are moving. And so that's in terms of the evidence is growing, but also our, our thinking and our understanding and the, and the context, you know, the policy context, the community context is changing. So if we're in the same point as we are now in 10 years and we haven't kind of evolved or grown or developed with, you know, and been influenced by all of those factors over that time, it would be a, a mistake and a, and a real problem. Um, but at the same time, it, it's it's a call to, to work in a way that sees us continue to challenge and to develop our way of thinking and so on as we we move forward. Yeah, fantastic. Um, look, we've had well over 100 questions, which is absolutely fantastic. And so I'm trying to group and theme um, a, a lot of these. I, I think it would be important to touch on rural and remote um, and particularly also um, areas of uh, Indigenous health. And um, uh, Emma, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that and, and whether, you, you know, that, that you, we've identified that as a research gap and, and what could be the steps forward from here? Um, we know that's a research gap. I mean, there, there aren't those systematic reviews um, in that area because there aren't many reviews yet. There is much research. So Liz Pelicano's um, group that did we, we Are Up, Look After Our Own Mob, which was released last year, is a great example of research that highlights that there are gaps and there are differences between um, service provision for autistics and Indigenous Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities and non. So we know that gap exists. Um, I think that one of the great things, as David said, is because things are evolving so rapidly and so many people are listening now and taking these things on board, I think that the research will catch up slowly. With, I'm really excited as a researcher, a professional and, and an autistic that to be in this time where people are listening and wanting to be better. Yeah, David? Yeah, I think I agree. And some great opportunities. We've all changed the way that we live and work and do things over the last little while, hey? Um, and telepractice, for example, has, has come to the fore and it's something that um, I declare I have an, an interest in from a research point of view. But what I would say is we've got to be... Um, we've got to learn from the stories that Emma was talking about, you know. Innovation is often driven, almost always, I think, by individuals coming up with a simple, better way to do something and then sharing it, and it catches fire from there. Researchers have a role to play in supporting that process and ultimately evaluating and so on. But the more suggestions that can come from the people who are actually accessing these services, the more influence you can have in terms of telling clinicians or educators what, you, what you'd like to do, how you'd like to work, have input into the NDIS consultation process that's open at the moment. Tell people what you think because it's from the, those thoughts, those personal experiences, that the, the best innovations will happen. It's paramount that there's equity and access to services, um, rural, remote, geographical isolation. That is solvable in many cases now, or at least better able to be addressed, and we should be moving quickly to do that. Thanks, David. Thanks also, Emma, for answering the first bit of that question. That's um, terrific. Um, I just wanted to really, um, I'm just trying to do an overarching sort of theme um, that I'm seeing coming through. I, I um, the, the CRC is strongly of the view that the next step is that this is this is one one step in a three step process, which is around getting the consultation of the clinical and the lived experience and family um, uh, voices to develop an early intervention guideline. We have questions um, around, well, if, if more isn't necessarily better, then what's the minimum amount of time? We have questions around, how do you quantify that magic? That is what comes through a consultation that involves not just evidence. Science is not, not the answer to everything. Science is one part, one very important ingredient to helping to guide how we can provide the best support for, for kids and families. And, and that is the CRC strong view that this is the foundation, but there are next steps in terms of um, uh, developing an early intervention guideline through a, a, a consultation. So look, that's all we've got time for. I'm absolutely um, thrilled that so many people joined us. We had well over 800 people join us throughout this. Um, I just want to thank David and Emma for sharing their time, the insights, and also just to acknowledge the full um, uh, uh, team that developed that. Thank you to them all. I'd also like to thank you for joining us today. And I hope you found the, um, the, the webinar informative and insightful. We couldn't get to any or all of the questions, but if you would like your question um, uh, sent uh, to one of the uh, um, uh, presenters today or me, um, please uh, email us at 
hello at autismcrc.com.au. That's hello at autismcrc.com.au. Um, we also have um, a further few webinars coming up, so take a look at them um, on, on the CRC website and sign up. Um, look, that's it from us. Can I also just acknowledge Kelly Jackson, Sally Vidler uh, and um, Jason in the background who are coordinating all of this. They do an absolutely amazing job and we're really thrilled that they could um, help us out with this. Finally, thank you one more time to you um, and, and please do um, keep the vibrant um, uh, commentary and conversation going. This is how we improve um, uh, support and care um, for kids on the spectrum and their families and that's what we're all in it for. So thank you so much everyone and see you soon. <laughs>